So I start off with Japan. The cyclicality of this index, as you point out, does that mean you expect to see parts of this market playing catch up? Absolutely. I think that's the, and good morning, I think that's the case around the world that, you know, we've seen a very strong performance if we look at what's happened in China, if we look at what's happened in the US, and now we're looking at the parts of the world which still are having that catch up potential to come through, and the developed world most importantly at the moment, given what's happening with the Delta variant. And that does point towards Japan, where you are still seeing the prospect for a lot of fiscal support, monetary policy support, um, and as well as that, uh, consumption to return. And it should all be beneficiary of what we're seeing in the global economy and starting to perform. And on top of that, the valuation argument uh, is not nearly as bad as many other parts of the world. And is it a similar uh, sort of strategy when it comes to Korea, particularly when it comes to benefiting from a gradual reopening? I think the story is a little bit different when it comes to emerging markets. Uh, right now, we are seeing the staggered reopening around the world. When it comes to Asia Pacific and, and broader emerging markets, we're a bit more conscious of the vaccination rollout and as well as that is what we're seeing with the spread of the Delta variant. And obviously in Asia, things have been a little bit slower to catch up in terms of the, the vaccination rollout. Better prospects in Korea because of that, but Korea has been a strong performing market already this year uh, and valuations have moved a little bit. The focus though has to be on the broader economy. And as we do see that improve, we do see more potential for emerging markets to catch up. We would just be a little bit more hesitant in terms of that positioning right now, given that uh, concerns around the coronavirus and the movement uh, in commodity prices, we'd like to see this be a bit more stable and those vaccination rates move a bit higher before thinking about that rotation from developed into emerging markets more broadly. Talking about valuations, are we there yet for Chinese stock markets where we could actually find some cheap bargains? Well, it depends on your time horizon, uh, really. I think valuations probably look pretty good if you're thinking about what's going to happen in the next five years. Uh, when you're thinking about what's going to happen in the next five days, you've probably got bigger questions. And I think that's the trouble with investors at the moment. They're, they're thinking about what the potential near-term implications may be from further regulatory changes and how that's going to weigh on the market. For us, China has always been a very long-term investment strategy, and I don't think that's changed. Um, the regulatory uncertainty that's been created is very much directed at trying to achieve a lot of the long-run economic objectives that the Chinese officials want. It just comes at the expense of some near-term uncertainty. But we've also got to remember there's the policy tools to try and address that through fiscal and monetary policy to bring that stability uh, into the economy and financial markets. So it's really a case of thinking about whether you're, as an investor, prepared to maybe wear some further financial losses uh, or you want to wait until the markets are recovered and perhaps miss out on some of the financial gains that come through. So I think that China is definitely something to watch. Uh, I think that investors are going to remain a little bit uh, hesitant and seem to mm. remain a little bit negative until there's a clearer signal that those regulatory changes really have uh, passed. We have seen Asian tech shares outside of China gain ground, especially hardware stocks, given also the really uh, race to zero when it comes to yields in the U.S. and Europe. Are those uh, some of those sectors that you're looking at? I think Asia-Pacific technology is something definitely to, to keep in mind uh, a watch on, uh, given what we've seen in the semiconductor space and how that's uh, going around the world, the, the supply constraints and demand that's quite clearly there. I think that's going to be something that's going to be very positive. More longer term, as we see places like China and the US trying to become more uh, self-sufficient in technology, particularly in semis, that's going to actually be quite beneficial for some of the players in Taiwan. Uh, so it is going to be a case of thinking about them being in tune with the global recovery some of these bigger strategic changes that we are seeing, and we would expect them to still continue to perform. The thing that's hampering leaders at the moment, though, is, is really around the domestic conditions, the, the COVID variant, as we've mentioned, uh, and the ability to, to really control the domestic environment rather than thinking about the external sector.